Matthew 25, verse 14 to verse 30. Responsively, this is the parable of the talents. Verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, and to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that hath received two, he also gained other two. But he that hath received one, went and digged in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh, and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came, and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own usury. Last three verses in unison, please. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which had ten talents, for unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen and Amen. May God bless us in the public reading of his most holy and sacred word. The diligence in watching, as you know from verse 14, the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is, is in italics, which means the King James translators, when they came to the translation of this verse, they understood that this ellipsis, not omission, because ellipsis is a deliberate omission, not that there was a mistake. They understood that this ellipsis, which is sometimes for emphasis, you know, in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, in poetry, in Proverbs and in Psalms in particular, you realize that there are quite a fair bit of translation by our King James translators that are written in the italics. And then you have been told that when it is written in the italics, it is not in the original languages. And because it is not in the original languages, when you come across italics like this, you might find that, well, then it should not be considered as the Word of God. In a sense, you are right because it is not found in the text. But one of the ways that the biblical writers needed to emphasize a point is to use ellipsis. Ellipsis means a deliberate omission. 
In other words, silence speaks louder than words. That's what they do. So the deliberate omission, as far as when it is written in Hebrew and in Greek, it doesn't compromise the readability and the construction of the sentences. But in English, as you can see, if the italics were omitted, for as a man traveling into a far country, you will find that that translation by the King James translators would be a problem. Because it is poor English, right? For as a man traveling. It's incomplete. But in Greek and in Hebrew, such ways of communication are very, very acceptable. And when you sometimes read these italized words, please take note, just because it is not in the text in written form, it doesn't mean that it is not part of God's words. Understand them, read them in terms of its emphasis. Because when you look at the context, like in this instance, you know that the deliberate omission is to let us know when Jesus Christ gave the disciples these two parables, one after the other, consecutively. It is for emphasis. To let us know that once you have decided to be vigilant in witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ, how to do it? Then the Lord gave us this parable on, of diligence, stewardship. Telling us that to be vigilant doesn't mean that you sit there and do nothing. I'm not sure whether you have read of instances where some foolish Christians, they want to wait for the Lord's soon return by selling everything they own. They give it to the poor or they give it to some Christian causes. Then they change into white garments. And then a group of them together with their children and their whole family would go up to a mountaintop and then they just look up into the heavens and they just wait. Have you ever read such instances of foolish behavior? This is not vigilance. This is foolishness. It doesn't mean that you sit there and stare up into the heavens and watch and wait for the Lord to blow the last trump in heaven and then he will descend from heaven and then he will catch you up while you are staring up into the heavens on top of some mountain, dressed in white. Please don't ever understand the vigilance in that sense of sitting, doing nothing. What the Lord has taught us concerning the ends is a very good, simple explanation of the importance of diligence. Proverbs 6, 6 to 11 where the Lord tells us how we need to be diligent. Go to the end. In other words, study the end. Thou sluggard, right? That's the opposite of someone who is diligent, slothful, lazy, right? That's what the Lord described the servant with one talent. Wicked and slothful, lazy. All right, go to the end, thou sluggard, telling any one of us who did nothing and still doing nothing for Christ and for the cause of Christ. Not that you're not doing anything in this context of the Bible, but you're doing a lot of things, but not a single thing is for the cause of Christ and for the blessing of God's people. Consider her ways and be wise, which, having no guide, overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. The end understood the importance of planning for the future. All right, because when winter comes, there is no way they're going to find food. And so they store up during summertime because they know the winter will soon follow. After summer, you have autumn and then you have winter, then spring, and the process will go on. And so the end would know to provide for summer enough to go all the way through winter and gathereth her food in the harvest how long will you sleep O sluggard when will thou arise out of thy sleep yet a little sleep a little slumber a little folding of the hands to sleep so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man amen a little sleep a little slumber and before you know it you are so close to breathing your last breath the hardworking end, according to John Silling, 
a Purdue University entomologist. The ant is an exemplary worker. Basically, the ant's entire life, which can range up to seven years, is spent working, says John Silling. They gather food, they bring it back to the nest, and they use it for day-to-day -day meals as well as to store for the winter. In addition, he noticed, the amazing insect can be adept. Some species gather bits of grass of leaves and take them back to their nest. On this organic matter, which is used much like fertilizer, they place tiny mushroom spores and grow them for food. So not only do they gather food, they know how to grow food, according to this entomologist. But ants are also dairy keepers. Not diarrhea, dairy means milk. That's right. Some ants get the majority of their food by milking aphids or plant lice, which are often known as ant cows, says the scientist. The ants sometimes herd the aphids down into the ant nest at night or when it starts to get cool. Then when it gets warm again, they herd them back up to the plants. So the ants are more than just food gatherer as we know it. According to this entomologist who study ants for a living, he made these observations to tell us that they know how to fertilize, they know how to milk as well. So when they gather is not enough, they can plant, they can also be like cows. Amazing, isn't it? God's creation. And God wanted us human beings made in the image of God to learn from the ants. In a way, it is very, very amazing and wonderful, but at the same time, it is also very shameful on our part, isn't it? Why do we need ants to teach us, and yet God says, go to the ant, to the slugger, to those who are lazy? Are you waiting for someone to lead you, to hold your hand, to guide you before you do something? The ant doesn't have any leader, any guide, and they know, and they spend the entire seven years, that's how long they live, working. You know, when God warns us in the Sermon on the Mount, the new attitude that we need to have in terms of our possessions. If you came to know Christ at the age of 25, you already have some possessions. And those possessions, you use to lean upon them, you use to trust in them, God says, you stop loving mammon and now you love God. No man can serve two masters. Either you love the one and hate the other. No man can love both. And so you've got to choose. Now love God and not the possessions that you have already gathered. And then the other type of possessions would be those that we continue to seek after. Right? There's, there's basically only two types of possessions. And the reason is obvious. Right? You agree. Inflation tells us that we need to work hard to increase what we already own. Otherwise, because of inflation, we probably will not have enough for our evening years, assuming you can live up to 70 years, and by reason of strength, add another 10 more. And then on top of that, you and I know that everything that we gather and assemble for food have an expiry date, even canned food. They all have an expiry date, and so therefore, even if you store a mountain load, that will be more than enough to sustain you for the rest of your life until you reach 80, you know that much of it, almost all of it will turn bad, even though you may freeze it. And so therefore, you need to keep on working. Keep on working. And that is part of the original curse. When God cursed Adam and said, now I'm going to make sure that thorns and thistles will grow out of this earth, so that by the sweat of your brow, you're going to work very hard until dust you shall return, until you die. And so the Lord understood. And we know hard work is good, is fine, because the longer you, hard work, you work hard, the more you work hard, the less time you have to play. And our play does not mean playing badminton. You know when the Bible says that their people are playing. All right, at the Golden Calf incident, when Moses and Joshua came back down, they saw them playing. They were not playing table tennis. They were committing transgression, fornication, adultery. When people 
want to have shorter weeks, working hard, where do you think they would go? Club? In Australia, you have so many casinos, they will indulge in their vices, their drug culture, gambling, smoking, drinking, and all sorts of wicked activities. That's basically the sinful nature. That's why God says, I want you to work hard so that you will have less time to sin. But no matter how God wants us to work hard, we will still find time to sin. And so for us as Christians, diligence is something that you have to keep on reminding yourself to fight against so that you will remain diligent because the world will try to steal you away from your diligence in watching. That is the agenda of the devil. To be diligent means to be steady, to be earnest, to be energetic, to spend your effort devoted and painstakingly working, applying what you have learned from God's Word and be a blessing to others. That's diligence from a Christian perspective. Not doing your own thing. Diligently doing your own thing, providing for your family so that you can own a few houses, one in each major city. You are very diligent for your own benefit, for your family's benefit, but not for the cause of Christ. The diligence in watching has everything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if it is not with the Lord Jesus Christ and for His sake and for the blessing of God's people, which is an indirect serving the Lord as well, then you are not diligent. You may be working very hard. That's what the Lord said, right? To many, I have done this and I've done that. The Lord says, you are nothing but a laborer, a worker of iniquity. Were they hardworking? Were they diligent? Yes. But diligent in what? In iniquity. So working hard in itself is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to diligence in watching. The question is, who are you working hard for? My observation is when a person migrates from one country to the next, he has to almost start everything afresh. And in order for him to start everything afresh, he has to work very hard. He is like the salmon swimming against the tide to try to fit into a society that has already been moving at a particular pace. You come from a country that is moving in a different pace and so now you try to jump in and try to find that pace and try to move along at that pace to find your niche. And you have to provide for your family at the same time and everyone will have to make new friends. New culture, new food, new environment, new everything and a new way of life, new way of thinking. I'm not sure whether you have already changed. Some of you might have, some of you might not have because you may, be, you may not have been here long enough. For example, in Singapore, when you meet someone and the person tells you if you were to ask direction, it's very near, you just walk in this direction and you're going to arrive. Very near, no problem. And so 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, you arrive. Well, very near. That's Singapore standard, right? You know that, right? When I was in Kenya, in Nairobi, you be very careful. When you ask a Kenyan, if you are lost, and he tells you, you walk in this direction, it's very near, don't worry, you just walk. You know their definition of near? Four hours. To them it's near. And then they say, if they were to tell you, oh, this is not near, this is far, but not very far, but far, not very far. You know how long the travel? Two days. Very far, anything more than four days travel. Now that's in Kenya. I don't know, I don't know Australia. If someone tells you it's very near, how many what, minutes or hours? Mindset changes. When you live in a big country, and a small country. In Kenya, the reason why for them walking one day to attend a service is normal. Because it's not very far, right? Far means two, hours, two days. One day is okay. But for us, when someone tells you, you know, these people are so devoted, they walk one day just to attend a service. You're very impressed, right? Because our contact in Singapore, if I live in Changi to come to 
Jurong for church, I'm not going to come. You know, Changi to Jurong, on Sunday, half an hour you will be enough. But for us, that's very far, right? Because you go any further than Jurong will be twice, and the, anything more than twice will be into the sea. <laughs> right? I mean, this is the mindset of a person who lives in a tiny island. My time, my distance is near, so anything more than 15 minutes, I'm not, I don't like to drive far for food. Unless there is a very, very good reason. Church member invited me to this place for a meal, and so more for the sake of the Christian fellowship and the church member fellowship, I would go. But by and large on my own, you asked me to drive to some place in Changi to eat the most delicious plate of chicken rice, I won't go. Even if it's the best in the world, even if it is free of charge, I won't go. Because I don't like to travel for food. For me, food is just put into your mouth, swallow, fill your stomach, and that's it. I have a very, very terrible tongue. I don't taste food very well. That's why I love army food. <laughs> yeah, I love army food. I was in the army in the 1970s. You just imagine, not today's army. Today's army, all the food are catered from Singapore food industry. Cooked by very good cooks. During my time, our food was cooked by 18-year-old national servicemen who had never cooked before in their entire life. And the reason why I like army food is because I can eat as much as I want. Because to me, quantity is the definition of good food. <laughs> Not quality. That's why you see those... So sometimes church members, they invited me to this nice, very expensive six-star restaurant, and then I wait and wait, and the food comes, I look at the menu. Wow, so expensive. Ah. One plate, 50 over dollars. And then when the food comes, wow, you take a picture, it's so beautifully designed, three mouths full gone. <laughs> Good, to me it's not good, beautiful, wow, beautiful, but there's no quantity of 50 over dollars for a meal that I can just really put into my mouth, three scoop and it's gone. Full, my stomach is still waiting for the food to flow all the way down from my mouth to my stomach and by the time it reaches the throat, it's gone. My food, my stomach is still hungry, but it's $50 gone. Is that good? It's not good. We live in a world, you now moved here. You fight for everything. And so, I know in big countries, based upon my observation, families will split up very readily and easily because of work situation. Your children study hard, they grow up, they finish education, they work in a company, a company says, okay, I want to send you to Melbourne, yes or no? With a promotion, your home base is here. And so now, one son will go over. Your daughter will go over, they get married, the son-in-law moves over, and so you hardly will see them except by way of electronic gadgets. In Singapore, how far can you move? We are always together. And so the mentality of a family born family unit within a tiny island of Singapore, our concept is, even though my children are married and have their own home, it's definitely not as difficult as compared to here when they literally have to move to another state and to see them, you've got to fly. How often can you fly? It's not cheap. And they can't fly back and forth, time-wise, their work situation. So their mindset, their mentality is one of struggle. And so you have the struggle of the physical, and then now you have the Lord telling you to be diligent in watching. And so your challenges in life in such a big country as a migrant trying to fit in will be far more challenging than someone who is a local. Grew up in this country whereby he doesn't have to make any major adjustments in his thinking and his manner of life because he grew up in this country. He grew up in a big country. He already know how to adjust and adapt because it's his entire life, the only life he knew. You come from a tiny island like Singapore to come in your whole way of thinking will be challenged to the very core. Near, far, this is just one tiny little example. The food, the culture, the climate. Right? You've got winter clothes, summer clothes, all kinds. In Singapore, you and I know. Just one set. That that's all we need. All our winter garments, we just vacuum back them. Unless we want to travel on holiday, it will remain vacuum packed. We will never need to take it out. 
For you, you have to take it out. Well, summertime is ending. Replace it. I don't know what you do with it. I don't know how big a cupboard you have. Maybe one for summer, one for spring, one for autumn, one for winter. I do not know. And so you fight for everything. And then when you come to church, now your pastor will tell you, your leaders will tell you, the Word of God will tell you, serve the Lord, serve the Lord, be diligent. Your time is short. If you do not work hard and serve, you're going to waste every minute and they will come back again. And then you will have in the back of your mind, but what about my family? What about my home? What about my bank account? What about so many areas, so many things that you have to struggle with and balance? Then they are real. Actually, it's for all of us, isn't it? That has always been the way for every servant of God from the beginning of the fall. The balance, the challenge. So how to make sure that we are diligent regardless of how our life may change. When Jesus tells us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that is the hallmark of diligence. You have to trust Him. How to do that? Based upon this parable, first and foremost, the parable is between a lord and his slaves. The word servants there are all do said slaves. So the first thing you must understand when it comes to diligence is, as a child of God, you cannot separate your secular, so-called secular life, your personal, physical well-being with your church life, your spiritual well-being. They are one and the same. That is something that you must first accept and realize. The moment you dichotomize it, you think that why I'm in the world, I'm not spiritual, I'm not serving the Lord, I'm not doing anything for the Lord, and the Lord doesn't know what I'm doing. It's just basically to keep my body and soul together, to pay my bills and to provide for my family when I'm out there. With this kind of thinking, you can never be diligent the way that the Lord expects you to be. You must trust in Him. You must know that He is the Lord, and everything that you have on this earth is like that of a slave. Now you and I know that a slave is worse than a steward. A steward is someone who serves. All right, He may not be a slave. And that's why sometimes when you describe this as stewardship of talent, but you must understand it as a stewardship of talents by slaves. Now you and I know slaves cannot own any property. Slaves, basically by nature of who they are as slaves, they are not permitted to own anything. Because the moment you own something, you cannot call yourself slaves. That's the mindset, that's the meaning of the word slave. All right, a slave is a person who just simply will do everything the master says and everything that he does, owned by the master. He owns nothing. Now that is the first understanding of diligence. Your family, they are not yours. Your children are not yours. Your life is not yours. Your strength, your time on earth, they are not yours. They belong to the Lord. Now, if you do not see and understand this, that you cannot own anything and you really do not own anything, you cannot be diligent and expect the Lord to say to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant or faithful slave. As long as you think that you own something, you will make a decision on your own for your own personal gain and benefit, you're going to ignore the Lord. And whenever the Lord says to you through the messages that you hear, and now you are convicted, you are now challenged, you are now provoked, you're going to fight it. You're going to be against it. You're going to resist it. Because you think that your life is yours. You think that your son, your daughter, because they are named after your surname, they are yours. They are not yours. They are gift from your heavenly Father, whom God expects you to one day return to Him. And the only way that you can return these precious gifts of life, your children, back to your Heavenly Father is they come to know Christ as Lord and as Saviour. If they do not, you go before the Lord, you will be empty-handed. God is not interested in you presenting to Him your bank account. He doesn't want your bank account. Your bank account for the service of the Lord is only good while you use it on earth. On the day of judgment, you can show him your bank book, whatever it is. 
How many millions of dollars I have gathered and assembled for you, Lord? The Lord says, it's no use in heaven. You know that, right? This is worthless. It was only good when you were living on earth. But you did not spend any of these things for the cause of the Lord. Now I notice from your weekly that you plan to have an extension and you are short of about a million dollars according to the number that was there, right? How many of you are like the people in the days of Moses when Moses challenged the people according to God's command? Tell the people one thing. Those who are willing and happy to give, you will receive. That's the only condition. Willing giver. Cheerful, willing giver. That's it. And you will notice when you study those chapters in Exodus, three types of people in Israel. The first group will be those who immediately they hear the call. They love the Lord Jesus Christ. They will not think a second thought. They will just simply give willingly what do you need? Oh, we need this kind of gold, this kind of jewel for the breastplate of the high priest. We need gold, a lot of it, so that we could cover the Ark of the Covenant and we have to beat the gold into thin pieces to cover it so that it will have the golden look. So we need a lot of gold. And so those who really want to give, they do not want to ponder and consider. They just see the need there. They love the Lord. They just give. Happily, cheerfully. And then there will be the second group. The second group will be those, no matter what, I'm not going to give. I have to think of my family, my children, myself, because we are on the way to the promised land. I do not know what the promised land is going to be like. I need to keep as much as possible from what I have gathered from the Egyptians. When we departed, the Lord told us to ask them, and they gave us so much. I like this precious emerald, this jewel, this topaz, this diamond, whatever it is, they just, wow, this is expensive, I can't give. And so there'll be those who just simply absolutely will not bother. And then the third group may be the largest of all. They will be the ones who would vacillate, ponder, ah, should I or not, should I or not, should I or not, should I give or not? I think of my children, my wife, but they might not live that long. Then, what am I saving for? And so they will reason, they will think, they will ponder, they will debate. And then finally, some of them may lean on the other side and give. But then there will be those who will be slow. They will continue to procrastinate and procrastinate while the people were giving, they were constructing, and then they were still gathering more and more. And then one simple day, Moses said to the Lord, we have more than enough. Tell the people, no need. And then the moment that Moses said, no need, those guys who procrastinated, vacillated, give, don't give, give, don't give, no need. The window was closed. The door of opportunity shut forever. Is there going to be a second tabernacle? No. They failed to realize that in this generation, in their lifetime, there was only one tabernacle and there was only this narrow window where they could give. How many of them took advantage of that blessing because they saw it as the work of the Lord? Now you have been given this opportunity. Previous generation, no need for any renovation. After the renovation is completed, the next generation, if the Lord tarries, no need. So do not see this as a chore and a burden, but a privilege. Diligent in the use of your finances, your substance, is part and parcel of it. If you see this as mine, you will not give. You belong to which group? One, two, or three. There's no four. A four will be maybe unbelievers. Fine. God says, we don't need unbelievers. That's why I thank God when your corrected offering on the Lord's Day, you make that qualifier. Giving is an honour and a privilege given to God's people. If you do not understand, please do not feel compelled to give. Very good. Let the unbelievers know we're not here for your money. We don't want your money. We want you to know Christ as Lord and as Saviour. And that is very significant and important because we know of unbelieving parents 
warning the children, you go to church, you go to church, they all care only for your money. And what happened to Kong Hee in Singapore did not help. It made matters even worse. You know what he did, right? Embezzles 26 million, then took another 26 million to cover up the first 26 million, and he went to jail for it. And now that he's out, and because his church numbered in the 20s and 30s, thousands, it became big, big news in Singapore. He lived in a penthouse in Sentosa Cove, and that penthouse is worth millions of dollars. But they preach a health and wealth gospel, right? What do you expect? You can't expect him to preach health and wealth gospel and live in HDB flat, right? True? If he wants to preach health and wealth gospel, he has to be healthy and wealthy. It's just like, you know I will never, never be a salesman for hair growth. True? If I sell you, you're going to buy or not? You're very good, your hair will never fall. Then you look at me. You think, you think I will sell? You'll buy from me? Nobody will buy hair growth serum from me, right? Obviously. So if I want to preach a health and wealth gospel, I cannot be sickly, I cannot live in HDB flat, I got to live in somewhere that is at least worth a few million. And that's where he lived, a penthouse in Sentosa Cove. Obviously. But when we preach holiness, we better be holy. If a pastor preaches holiness and he is not holy, he is in trouble. How do you see yourself in relation to stewardship? Owner or slave? The Lord owns everything. Now, if this is not your perspective, as you begin to study this parable, you will not be able to understand and accept what the Lord intended. And you will probably end up like the first talent, because this is again for professing believers. Those who call themselves Christians, the Lord already said in the previous parable, you must be vigilant. How to be vigilant? First, you be diligent. Tomorrow's message will teach us the manner of watching, where we are going to emphasize in greater detail what it means and how to be diligent with the right motive, with the right understanding. But you have to be diligent, hardworking. And so the Lord tells us, they are His goods, right? Verse 14. This is, again, common in the time of Jesus. And the one who would travel is usually the provincial king, like Herod. Herod, every year, will have to go back to Rome to report to Caesar, and he will gather whatever taxation from this part of the Roman Empire that he was put in charge of. And so he will travel a long distance, and the servants whom he put in charge of his home, of his estates, of all that he owned, they would not know when he will return except for the fact that he will definitely return. And so based upon this annual journey, whether it was Herod or later on Felix, Festus, Agrippa, it doesn't matter, these are all provincial king appointed by Caesar who is in charge of the whole Roman Empire and they conquered so many different other nations and they were put in this part of the promised land someone who understood Jewish culture. And these provincial kings, they do understand Jewish culture. And so they will make this annual journey back to report to Caesar how they have been faring and whether they are able to maintain peace and prosperity and through the taxation that they gather, it is proof that they are very capable and Caesar will pat them on the back and send them back to continue. So borrowing this annual journey of the provincial ruler, provincial king reporting to Caesar, Jesus now used this to teach us a very important spiritual lesson far country and in our context the Lord there is definitely Christ and unto one he gave five talents now the talents here is not to be understood according to our definition of a talent someone plays the piano very well a concert pianist you will say the person is so talented you know that this is not a reference to that kind of talent the talents here basically refer to Greek coins whose value equals 6,000 days or about 20 years of wages of a daily wage worker. So it's a lot of money. 
all right? One talent is equivalent to 6,000 days or 20 years of a daily wage worker. So to be given five talents, that's a whole lot of money, okay? And then to another two talents, another one talent. So the first thing we understand concerning serving the Lord in terms of diligence is all of us will be given different gifts, different responsibilities. All right, that's why we are called into full-time ministry. You are not. Some of us are. And then when you are in the ministry, in the congregation, some of you are called to look after children because you love children. You're able to relate to children. You're able to teach children. You have the patience to care for children. No matter how naughty they are, you know how to deal with them. You know how to care for them. You know how to get, make them to listen to you. And there are others who are very good in looking after the elderly. Right? You have the patience, you have the long-suffering to care for them, to look after them. You know they are very much like children. True? Very much. As I grow older and older, I begin to observe and I really feel what's it like to grow old. In my HDB flat, that is this gentleman, my neighbour living in the same block, I watch him grow old. He used to carry his set of golf clubs and start playing golf. And then one day, he, I don't see him anymore. Then I saw him in a wheelchair. He hurt his knees and then he recovered. He's now walking with a walking stick and he will never be able to play golf again because something happened. He could not even walk upright. He has to walk like a man with a back problem. And then as I continue to observe, he gets older and older and I know soon he'll be in a wheelchair. And then when I look at my granddaughter, as she begins in life, she now has to be pushed around when she was much younger. Now she can run a little bit, walk a little bit, not that steady, but she still needs the pram. So now you have the pram for the baby, the wheelchair for the elderly. Right? And so when I look at my granddaughter, when she eats, she has to eat very, very soft food, drink mother's milk, and then later on, soft puree food and so on, because she has no teeth. Then you look at the old elderly man, also no teeth. Right? The baby has very little hair. You look at the elderly man, also very little hair. You see? It's one big circle. Do you not agree? And then very soon, you know the babies, they can't uh, go to the toilet themselves. You've got to look after them, and the elderly, the same. The only big difference is, you know, right? One very cute, the other not so cute. <laughs> Correct or not? One very light, they one very heavy. But other than that, they're all the same. Now, there are those who have no problem looking after children, but you ask them to look after the elderly, they can't. There are those who have the patience and the long suffering to look after the elderly, but you ask them to look after children, they can't. They can't stand children, but they love to be with the old folks. How come? Different talents different gifts, different responsibility, different spiritual gifts. And you will find that it is the same for all of us. And the Lord knows. Some He will give five, some He will give two, some He will give one. Because the Lord makes no mistakes. And every believer is given at least one spiritual gift to serve Him, to be diligent in. You and I know that from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it is up to Him to decide. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all involved in determining who gets what spiritual gift or gifts. You can pray for it. I mean, the church can pray for a pianist if they don't have a pianist. The church can pray for a pastor when they don't have a pastor. But as an individual, if the Lord did not give you the gift of preaching, you can pray, Lord, please give me the gift of preaching. If you don't give me the gift of preaching, I'm going to starve and fast until you give me. You don't blackmail God. God is not going to give. That's why it's called gift, right? You can't ask for the individual, cannot ask for what spiritual gift. You just have to discover it, recognize it, and then improve on it. So if you have the gift of teaching, now you have to learn how to teach better and so the improvement will help you and make you better. Just like a person who is a very gifted pianist. You have to practice a lot, hours and hours of practice, but you must have that gift 
And there are some who are very, very good. And so when they practice and practice and practice with a very, very good gift, talent, they become very, very good pianists, right? But they have to practice. Same with the spiritual gift. Talents and spiritual gifts are different. Talents are given to believers and unbelievers alike to live in the world. Spiritual gifts are only given to spiritual people for spiritual purposes. And all of us are given at least one spiritual gift. Some are given more, but those who are given more, the Lord expects more from you. He doesn't give you at least two or three spiritual gifts and expect you to only serve using one. He gives you three, He expects you to serve three times more than the person who is given only one. So you've got to discover what your spiritual gifts are. For example, a concert pianist may be very, very good and have won many, many awards. That's a talent. And that concert pianist will use his talent to make money. That person will be in the limelight. His purpose is to be in the limelight, right? That's in the world. But if that person joins this church and you are short of a pianist, and then you heard of this wonderful concert pianist now, become a Christian, want to be a member of the church, and so you must give him an audition. And so the concert pianist, alright, give him the hymns, please play and let me listen. And so you know how concert pianist, the purpose and design of a concert pianist is to pay, play to draw attention to himself. Now that's the nature of the concert pianist, right? The whole orchestra will be waiting and then the concert pianist will march down onto the stage, the spotlight will be on him, and then when he is playing, everybody will be clapping and watching, and then when he finishes, he will bow down, and then he will continue to play when they shout for encore, encore, encore. And so the whole practice, six, seven, eight hours a day, is all how to be his focus. And then now when he begins to play on the church piano, and the focus is him or Christ. So now he has to literally change his entire thinking. So now he must play in a manner whereby he becomes invisible. That's the opposite. The moment he comes up and plays in his old manner, like in the world, you can rest assured it will be very fanciful. And then when he plays and you sing him, straight away, because of the manner in which he's playing, you're all going to focus your eyes on him. Does he have the spiritual gift? No. Then you're going to tell him, sorry, you have the talent of playing the piano, but you don't have the spiritual gift. Because the way you play, you are a distraction if you have the spiritual gift, you should play in such a manner, you become invisible and God's people, when they sing, they don't even know that you are there. They just focus on the Lord Jesus Christ alone, only. Now that is a spiritual gift. Just to help you have an example to distinguish between talent and spiritual gifts. Same with teaching. You may be the best teacher of mathematics out there. And you have won awards and the whole nation and, or state may put you on a pedestal and say this is the best secondary school teacher that we ever have in this state. And then you join the church and then we watch you teach. You may have the skill, the art of delivery, but you do not have the gift of teaching because you did not draw the spiritual lesson out of this passage of the Bible. But a spiritually gifted teacher would be able to do so. Then you're going to tell the person, sorry, you don't have the gift of teaching. Plain and simple. It's a spiritual book. Spiritual gifts are given to everyone so that you and I can be diligent because if you don't have a spiritual gift, you can say to the Lord, you didn't give me a gift. How do you expect me to serve? So it's God's fault. That's why the Lord made it clear. Everyone who is born again, you have been given at least one spiritual gift the moment you are born again. The moment you become a spiritual person, the spiritual gift is yours. And therefore, don't ever compare. You are here to complement and build each other up, not to compete with each other and tear each other down. Please, don't ever do that. Now, in this church camp, I notice evening, you have one organist. Daytime, you have another organist. Right? Now, you know, I don't play any music. I don't know how to play organ or piano. I just listen. Now, I hope that the pianists and the organists, when they come up and play, they do not have in their own heart, oh, I'm going to play better than the morning one. I'm going to play better than the evening one. 
Last Sunday, oh, that pen is not so good. Now let's see whether I'm going to be better. Don't you ever, ever entertain such sinful thoughts. The Lord knows your heart. If you notice that this pianist is not playing very well and you know the mistakes, you help the person to become better and better. And if the person that you help and you recognize that this person has a better spiritual gift than you have, and there are some who have a better spiritual gift, not all spiritual gifts, even though it's the same, are of equal standard. You help the person to become better than you, so be it. No envy, no jealousy, just praising the Lord. How many of us can say that we preach like Spurgeon? Not one of us. No theological training, but the way that he preached. Since he was 18 years old, long queue always formed wherever he preaches, or wherever he preached. He has a gift of preaching. If all of us have his gift of preaching to that degree, the whole world will be converted. But there's only one Spurgeon. Just like there are some who can play the piano better than others, but all of you have the spiritual gift of playing the piano. But some will be better. That's fine. I pray and hope that our students, when we teach them how to preach, that they will be better than us. You know the Chinese Kung Fu, you know Chinese Kung Fu master? You teach your disciple. Teach, teach, teach the best way. I always hold back one stroke, you know. Just in case the, the disciple become bad, you know, kill me, right? So I always hold back one final stroke that is the most powerful stroke. I teach the, my tutti everything except one. And so he learned, he learned, he learned. And one day he becomes bad. He wants to challenge me. I know one stroke more, right? So I tell the students when they come and learn Hebrew. Your, your pastor also my student. Learn Hebrew reading. You know, I hold back one stroke, you know, right? So you can understand, understand, understand. But there's one extra step I didn't teach you, you know? Of course, we didn't do that. Oh, you really thought I did that? Uh? <laughs> oh, you're terrible. You can't do that. We want to teach our students everything that we know, praying and hoping that they will be better than us because they are going to be the next generation that will look after all of you, your children. Why would we want to hurt the Lord's ministry? Because we understand that we are all slaves. You are all part of God's family. You belong to Christ, not us. That's how you must begin your attitude toward diligence. You own nothing. Serve the Lord as a slave to Jesus Christ. And that mentality must never, never be forgotten. And once you have that, then your concept of dichotomizing my private life, my family, my work life, and my church life will automatically be erased. The moment you see that I own this, I own that, my family, my children, that's the beginning of the end. You'll never be diligent. Oh, you'll be diligent serving yourself. You'll be diligent and you only serve the Lord after you serve your family and yourself. And whatever crumbs of time that you have fallen from the table, all right, pastor, these are the crumbs of time that I have left. Where do you want me to serve? You're serving who, pastor? Oh, Jesus Christ. You dare to give Jesus Christ the crumbs that fall off your table of time? Your time, your life on earth was, is given by Jesus. Everything about you, how long you live, how you live, who your wife is, who your children are, everyone, everything, the Lord's. And that is the beginning of this parable that must be impressed into our mindset before we go on. And then uh, very quickly, how long, how much time, we are not told, but very, very suddenly, right? The Bible tells us the five talents, they work hard and they serve. They got their five talents. The two talents did the same. And the one talent went to bury and he did nothing. And then uh, the Lord returns. After a long time, verse 19, the Lord of those servants, those slaves cometh. And now he says, tell me what you have done with the life, the time that I have entrusted to you. Accountability. Accountability. Diligence. Faithful evidence of righteous accountability. And so one by one they came. The five talents, they presented to the Lord, five talents. I work hard, Lord. This is what I have traded and what I have gained. He worked hard. 
You know how hard it is for him to gain five talents based upon the five talents that he was given. Remember, one talent is 20 years of work. It's a lot of money. And he must have traded very, very wisely, very, very diligently. And then the Lord replied to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. The word good there emphasizes benefits. Now, there are two very different words for good in Greek. Translated in English, the same word good. One is good in terms of his inherent nature, like you described. He is a good man, right? That is inherently, he's a good man. He's a Christian, he's a good man. Did he do anything? No, but he's a good man. So when you talk about good, whereby it benefits someone, it is a goodness that benefit, and that's the word. You know, you know the, the name Agatha. You know Agatha Christie? Agatha, now that's the word agathos. The goodness that you do that benefits someone. And that's the word. So it is not just being good as a good person, but you did a lot of good deeds. That's why the Lord said, good, very beneficial servant. That means a productive servant, a diligent servant, whereby his life impacted the life of many. And faithful, of course. Trustworthy. Can be trusted. Don't have to stand behind his bed, watching over him. You just assign him a task. No need to check on him. Rest assured, it will be completed on time. Faithfulness, trustworthy, very hard to find, impossible to find in the world, but every believer is supposed to be such. Amazing, isn't it? Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Now, when the Apostle Paul looked at his own life, he said that whatever persecution I have to endure for the Lord Jesus Christ in my service for Him, it is nothing compared to the glory that awaits me. In other words, whatever you have devoted and sacrificed and give to the Lord to serve Him on earth, no matter what you have sacrificed to be a blessing to God's people, it is nothing compared to what the Lord has in store for you in heaven when you arrive home. That's basically it. That's to help us realize and understand how precious our time and our service and our diligence on earth is. It has a direct impact to where and what you will be in heaven. Do you know that? That's how important this is. Your time on earth is very short. You just imagine a timeline. A timeline that has no end, eternity. And then right in the middle of the timeline, your starting point, the day of your salvation. The beginning of the timeline is the day of your birth, physical. That's your beginning, right? You never existed until you begin to exist in your mother's womb. Say you came to know Christ at the age of 30. The Lord calls you home at the age of 80. You only have 50 years. Now compared to the line that is eternity, that 50 years is just one tiny little narrow slit, right? Because eternity is no end. And that 50 years on earth will never return. You only have 50 years to serve the Lord and to demonstrate the kind of diligence on this earth that can impact the sinners that God has brought into your life for Christ. That can impact the brethren that God has brought into your life in BPCWA to help them become better, mature believers. And you and I know that we are far from perfect. You and I know that during these 50 years, there will be a lot of challenges, a lot of persecution, a lot of seduction, temptations, a lot of evil and wickedness and wicked people trying their best to snatch away and make you slothful, distract you. And sometimes your children, your wife, your burdens, cares of the world, all these can distract you to be diligent, focus on serving the Lord. And you know that 50 years, not every moment, every minute of the 50 years will be for Christ. You know that. And that's why the Lord in the previous parable said, we will slumber and we will sleep. And the Lord knows. But the Lord knows that the one who is diligent and vigilant will not give up. They will keep on striving, keep on striving to the very end. No matter how many times he slumbers, he falls, he will pick himself up with God's grace, repent, and he will keep on serving. And even if everybody stops serving, he will not stop serving. Because that's diligence. Because he knows that he is serving the Lord. As long as you understand that you are a servant, 
Everything that you now so-called own belongs to the Lord and the one that you are serving is the Lord himself. That is the anchor and the backbone of your unending diligence. The moment you forget this, the moment you think you're serving your family, your children and yourself and the church, you're going to be slothful. It's a matter of when. You cannot lose sight that you're serving the Lord. And all you want from service is well done, the good and faithful servant. His wonderful praise. Not man. If everyone ignores you and you are diligent and you serve to the very best of your ability and not a person comes to you and says thank you, it's okay. It's acceptable. And you will still serve diligently. You don't want to be noticed because you know that the moment you are noticed, you distract the Lord Jesus Christ because you want everybody to focus on Christ, not you. That's what the Lord says. It's only when I am weak, then only am I strong. The Apostle Paul wanted always to be invisible. He only wanted to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he is ignored and nobody knows him, nobody cares for him, it's fine with him. As long as you know the Lord, as long as you praise the Lord, that's all that concerns him. Because that is the amazing attitude of a slave, isn't it? A slave doesn't care about his name because it's a slave's name. He only cares about the name of his Lord because what he's doing is the Lord's. His time is the Lord's. His energy is the Lord's. His effort is the Lord's. Everything is the Lord's. And therefore, whatever he does is the Lord's. And so if you are blessed by it, it's the Lord's. Just bless the Lord and that's all the servant cares about. Now that must be the mindset of a diligent, faithful servant of the Lord, only to promote Christ. And you can't if you want to own something. You can't if you want to own your life. Why do you think Jesus Christ said, you want to follow me? Never forget the first two steps. Deny yourself, be a nothing. If you can't accept step number one, Jesus says, you don't need to follow me. Please, don't call yourself a Christian if you're not prepared to deny yourself. Because the moment you deny yourself, then I will tell you step number two. I will design for you your life from the day you are born again. Are you prepared to accept? You don't design your own life. Because the life that I designed for you is called the cross. Right? Take up the cross. And you and I know the cross is a life of suffering. The symbol of suffering is the cross. The Roman Empire popularized it, the cross. Crucifixion by death was not invented by them, but the Romans popularized it. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ says, the moment you are born again, you must understand that your life now belongs to me and I will design for you what life you ought to live and where you ought to serve, where you ought to go, what you ought to do. Are you prepared? If you are prepared, then third step, you follow me. Follow me in my footsteps. If you are not prepared to accept one and two, please don't call yourself a Christian. You are going to hurt yourself even more because you keep misrepresenting Christ and you keep hurting yourself and Christ and your children and everybody who comes into contact with you. You are a curse. You are a burden to them because you keep misrepresenting Christ. You keep projecting a Christ that is not according to Scripture, who is a loving Christ, a faithful Christ, a holy Christ. But you are carnal, you are selfish, you are self-centered, and all you care about is personal self-aggrandizement. But not the Lord. Not the servant, the slave of the Lord. And to do that, you own nothing. You are nothing. Everything that you have, everything that you own, every minute of every day, please know that it is the Lord's. And once you see that and understand this, you will become very generous with your time, with your energy, and with your substance. Remember, to every Christian, the thing that is the least worthy of least value in your life is materialism, material things. Before salvation, our bank account was the most important, right? After salvation, material things, the least important. Who said so? Jesus. He says, if you can't be faithful in the least, what was Jesus referring to? Monetary things, material things. If you can't be faithful in the least, how can I trust you to be faithful in the much? What is the much? Spiritual things, souls of men, women and children. These are the much. These are eternal. Your material things are the least important. 
See, to the world, how do we know that this is the thinking of the world? You know, in Singapore, money matters are very, very important to our government, especially what happened to City Harvest Church, from he, what he did. Whoa, so many strict rules and regulations have been drafted and enforced. If your church annual tithe and offering is this amount, this will be the list of rules that you have to follow. If it goes beyond this amount, this is the list of rules that you have to follow. And if it goes beyond $10 million and above, very, very strict rules. The treasurer can only be treasurer for how many terms, and then after that he has to step down, another one must take over, then you must make sure that you have your internal auditors, and then you have the external auditors, and so on. No, everything must be so strict, so prim, so proper. Then every annual congregational meeting, we make sure all the accounts are very carefully presented, every cent presented to the government and to the congregation. The least important thing to the believer, the most important thing to the people of the world. I don't blame them, because that's what we were like. But for us, the most important thing would be guarding the doctrines, guarding the spiritual life, the holy life of God's people. That's why when you read in your own church bulletin about giving one million dollar shot, it's between you and the Lord. Diligent. That means faithfulness in everything that you have. Your talent or your spiritual gifts. I beg your pardon. Spiritual gift, more accurate description. How have you been using it in serving the Lord? You come to church, you go, or are you serving? Or is the same people serving the same thing, holding many portfolios, and they are exhausted? How can you let that happen? How can you let the honour and the privilege of serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords slide away? And you don't even feel bad or feel guilty that you have missed so many opportunities to serve the Lord, and they are not going to return. Every minute you waste, every day you waste, it's a wasted day for the rest of eternity in your life. Don't waste anymore, redeem the time. Would you? Would you be diligent by redeeming the time and now take a very good, honest evaluation of all that the Lord has entrusted to you and how are you spending it? Think very carefully and make sure that every area of your life is diligently spent serving the Lord, promoting, promoting God's kingdom and God's work. Five talent, two talent servants receive the same response from the Lord. Well done, good, same word, faithful servant. Faithful in few, faithful in many. But verse 24 is the condemnatory evidence of someone who is not diligent. Now you watch. Then he which had received the one talent, he's supposed to be the easiest, right? Only one. And the Lord doesn't even expect double. He came and said to the Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strawed. First and foremost, he doesn't know the Lord, isn't it? He called him a crook. And then his second, he used the Lord as an excuse. I was afraid and I went and hid your talent. He knew that it was not his. He knew that what he owned belonged to the Lord. And now he blamed the Lord for doing nothing. He hid the talent in the earth. Lo, thou hast that is thine. Here it is. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow. Now please note, Jesus is not agreeing with him that he is slothful and lazy and crooked and wicked. That he is a thief, right? Because that's exactly what verse 24 says. This slothful doesn't know the Lord. Because the word know in verse 24 as confessed, admitted by the servant means experiential. I experience with you, Lord, how you are crooked. How you reap what you have not sown. How you gathered what you have not strawed. Now that from his perspective is I experience you in this manner. Verse 26, when the Lord repeated what he said, after the Lord uh, judged him and called him wicked and lazy, the Lord used, thou knewest, this knewest is in your head only, you know in your mind. The Lord is not agreeing with him in terms of experiential knowledge. 
The Lord is basically saying to you, think in your head, you say in your mouth, you say you know, you don't know me. You are saying all these things about me. And so the Lord is saying, you know in your own head that I reap where I sow not and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put money to the exchanges. If you know that I'm such a wicked person based upon what you say, the Lord is not agreeing with him. The Lord is using his own words to condemn him. Please understand this. And if I'm really so bad, should you not therefore at least put the money into the bank? At least you can get some interest. Right? Instead of burying it, and what did you do? Nothing. All that I have entrusted to you, what have you gained? Zero. So therefore, if all you care about is provide for yourself and your family and your children, and you come to church, it's just basically maybe what? To suit your own conscience? To give yourself some kind of spiritual purpose where Christianity is not the heart and soul of your existence. It is supposed to be the heart and soul of our existence. Without Christ, we are nothing. Agree? Or without Christ, you are still something. Then you are contradicting the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus cannot be wrong. Then I have to call you a liar. I can't call Jesus a liar because Jesus is very clear in that allegory. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you are not attached to me, you are nothing. You can do nothing. Plain and simple, it means you are not a believer. Just like vigilance. Diligence is the outgrowth of vigilance. In other words, without vigilance, you are not a believer. Without diligence, you are also not a believer. If you want to be vigilant, then the next step is be diligent. Be faithful in all that the Lord has entrusted to you and use it for the blessing of God's people and for the glory of the Lord. And to do that, you have to understand that you are a slave, you own nothing, everything that you have belongs to the Lord. Your whole bank account belongs to the Lord. And if the Lord has blessed you with sufficient funds, and you know you can give, the question is whether you want to or not. Please don't uh, read those books about giving. You don't have the money, but by faith, I promise the Lord, I'm going to give 10,000. And you have only in your bank account 1,000. So by faith, I promised the Lord 10,000. And so now, where are you going to find the rest of the 9,000? This kind is not called faith giving. This is called foolish giving. You don't give what you don't have. And those who say, well, give until it hurts, also nonsense. You give cheerfully. Happily, because you love the Lord. The moment you see this as the church of BPCWA and not the Lord's church, you're not going to give. The moment you see that this is the Lord's house, all of you are God's people, we are one big family, and the Lord has entrusted you with more finances than the Lord has entrusted others, now you are accountable to the Lord how you're supposed to handle the large amount of finances. You think the Lord is any man's debtor? The Lord is no man's debtor, He promised us that. And don't ever forget, it is an honour and a privilege to be alive during this window of time where you have a building project to give toward. Because once it is done, I don't believe that you have any plans for another renovation, right? And worse still, if the Lord doesn't tarry and He returns. The window of opportunity is now yours. Don't wait for it to close. And then you want to give. It's closed, my friend. Someone who is diligent will be very careful and sensitive to his surroundings where he can use it for God's glory. He is very, very careful, alert. That's a diligent person. You know, someone was asked, you are such a busy, important man. How come you can still read so many books? You are so busy with so many companies, so many projects to run. You know what he said to the reporter? You know, I always have a book open on my office table. And every time I know I make many phone calls, every time I make a phone call, and then when I talk to the person, when I call, and they always ask me to wait, hold on. Every time they ask you to wait and hold on, he starts reading. That's how he's able to read so many books. He doesn't waste a minute, in other words. You know, many of us, right? You, now, you, nowadays, you dial a bank. Oh, yeah, it's a nightmare. Press this button, press that button, press this button. After ding, ding, no, 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 no. After 15 minutes of calling so many, then if you have no, we cannot help in any way, press zero for the live person. 
after 15 minutes, now press zero. What do you say? Give me the option, press zero for the live person from the very beginning. And so 15 minutes, oh, no, 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 no. Imagine how many times I called the bank, how many 15 minutes I wasted. But this guy was smart. Every time they ask him to hold on, hold on a minute, he starts reading. Put the phone there, put on the speaker, he starts reading. A person who is diligent will know how to watch and observe opportunity to serve the Lord. Because he understands time here on earth is the Lord's and it is very precious. We're not saying that you cannot relax. You cannot have some hobby to relax. We all need relaxation because this body of ours cannot keep on working, working, working. That's why we see some of you kick the football outside just now, it's fine. Relax. This is another way of fellowship. Fine. The Lord knows. But don't waste. Don't waste. Redeem the time. Because everything that you have is the Lord's. But this one talent individual, you look at his end. Verse 28, Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to the one who had ten talents. For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not, shall be taken away even that which he hath. In other words, not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. The Lord brought you into the church. The Lord gave you many, many opportunities to believe in Christ. All this exposure, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, all the many interaction with God's people, they are meant to help you see Christ in your life and accept Christ as Lord and as Saviour. Do you know that? And that everyone around you are supposed to be co-laborers with God, whereby you are to build up each other's Christian faith. And what have you been doing? And then the Lord said at the end, I have given you so many years on earth after you say you come to know Christ as Lord and as Saviour, so many opportunities to serve, and you just simply wasted it all. And so the Lord says, I have nothing for you in heaven, not even a place. And so the conclusion, cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Same words as in verse 51 of Matthew 24 concerning the hypocrites. No salvation. So please do not treat vigilance and diligence as something trivial. You can have it. You don't want to have it. It's okay with the Lord. It's not okay. It is the yardstick and measure of your salvation. Who says so? Jesus. He said so. Weeping and gnashing of teeth is a description of hell. Again, okay. ask yourself, if someone have truly experienced Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, given the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, possessing the mind of Christ and the love of God shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Ghost the moment he accepted Christ, according to Romans 5.5, 5, how could he not be diligent? How could he not want to serve the Lord now that he knows the Lord and he is so grateful and thankful to the Lord for all that the Lord has done for him? I came to know Christ at the start of my second year in architecture. Like many Singaporeans, I wanted to work hard and earn lots of money to support my mom. I grew up in a multi-millionaire family. My dad was a very, very rich man. I remember living in Saramban. He was the member of parliament. He owned many, many tin mines and rubber plantations. We have so many cars. We have so many drivers. One driver for my dad, one driver for my Mom, one driver for the maid who will go marketing, one driver for us children when we go to school. Very rich, big house with a garden that can play tennis, with a mini golf course, with a landscape garden with fountains, beautiful, big home. My dad even owned a basketball team. And when my dad passed away at the age of 17, I was. We lost everything. My mom and all of us, nine children, were kicked out of our home. We lived in Singapore by then because Malaysia kicked Singapore out. And so my dad, as a member of parliament, understood that they were converting all the education into Bahasa. My dad did not want it. And since all nine of us were born in Singapore, it was very easy 
for us to come over to Singapore and that's why when we turn 21 we have to choose which citizenship and so we live in Singapore of course in another big house Bukit Timah Fifth Avenue right on top of a hill a very big house belonged to my grandmother and after my dad's passing we had no home rented a huge bungalow pink in color located somewhere in the midst of some rubber plant, not rubber, rambutan plantation and durian plantation in the middle of nowhere near Changi. Now I think taken over by the government to build the airport. Owned by my multi-millionaire uncle who rented this place to my mom so that all nine of us can stay there and live there. It's pink in colour and so from the main road I could walk in absolute darkness to this pink house almost every night. That's why I don't like pink. That's why I like torchlight because <laughs> enough of darkness. I like torchlight. I collect a lot of, I got about 30, 40 torchlights in my house. I collect them because I like the design. All right, I like design, I like torchlights. But anyway, that's beside the point. <laughs> then, little by little, my ambition to be rich just disappeared. That's gone. I just love God's word. I just love to go to church. I just love to have fellowship and sing hymns and praise the Lord. It's not my own doing, it just happened. And just before I graduated, when I finished my four and a half years of architecture, I just prayed one simple prayer to the Lord. Lord, if it is your will to go into full-time ministry, please let me work for three years. And then if you call me, I will go. Why I make that prayer, I have absolutely no idea. I just know that I love God's word very much. And so I started working. Two years into my working life, during one of the Sunset Gospel Hour services, I still remember the theme was burning out for Christ, where Dr. To, who was in charge, called a lot of BP pastors and full-time students of FEPC to give their testimonies of calling. And during one of those nights, the Lord used that to remind me of my promise. And that night, He began to call me to give up my architecture, to go into full-time ministry. I thought it was something that I didn't want to do because I was very afraid. That time I already met my wife, that time we were only boyfriend, girlfriend. And then I still have to help my brothers and sisters because now most of us are working the older siblings, except for my younger siblings. And then we all combine together, use our CPF to buy a condominium for my mom to live. At least now we have our own home for my mom, but all of us got to combine our salaries to pay for the CPF the bank as well, the money, the interest, the money that we borrowed. And so if I were to give up my job, how will my brothers and sisters continue to support and pay? So all these were my consideration, my excuses, and struggle with the Lord for six months until the Lord used the verse that I shared with you, take up the cross and follow me. That was the verse that the Lord used to convict me and to scold me. All my excuses, the Lord just erased it. But one of my excuses was, but what if my girlfriend Angie were to break off with me? Then that night I did my quiet time and the Lord said, anyone who loves father and mother, brother and sister more than me, even his own wife, is not worthy to be my disciple. The Lord scolded me and that excuse was gone. Then I said, Lord, why did you call me after I gave my HDB fair? I got no, no place to stay. Then that night, the Lord convicted me and the Lord said, Foxes have hope, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You want to give me that condition? Someone to lay your head first before you go full time? Again, he scolded me until I ran out of excuses. It's either now obey or disobey. And then that verse was used by the Lord to call me into full time ministry. Take up the cross and follow me. The cross is not covered with silk, it is not a life of luxury. It is not covered in steel. It's not made of steel whereby it will crush you and destroy you. It is made of wood. And the Lord says, I have carried it. And now, would you submit your life? And I will carry it with you. It's made of wood. It's a life of suffering. And so I pray for the first time after six months of struggle, I surrendered my life to the Lord and the Lord was lifted. I always liked architecture very much, but that six months, my liking for architecture evaporated and it returned immediately after I surrendered my life to the Lord and so a couple of weeks later I told my boss the Lord has called me to full-time ministry 
I'm sorry, I need to resign. So I told him, I give you, I give him one year notice to finish my project in Ujjung Pandang to finish the design of the university. And so, all in all, three and a half years, six months of struggle, three months of working. I asked the Lord to help me, let me serve for three years because I need to serve and give money to my mom to support my siblings, my younger brothers and sisters. Just as my older brothers and sisters, they work hard, give money to my mom to support my studies in university. That's why I asked for three years. And so the Lord gave me three years. And after that, I went into full-time ministry. And I thank God. When I shared this with my wife, my wife said, if the Lord has called you, it's fine. And so the Lord has never, never allowed us not to have a roof over our head. Every step of the way, the Lord had provided. The Lord was very gracious and merciful to serve the Lord. So how can we not be diligent in serving the Lord when the Lord has given His everything to us? And for us to give everything back to Him, it's only our reasonable service and we must give everything back to Him as unprofitable servants. And so the Lord called me into full-time ministry when I was 29 years old. No home, nothing. And I gave up whatever savings I had because in my previous church, they wanted to tell the congregation members they were about to purchase a piece of property, joint venture with Mount Carmel to buy a church piece of to build a, a church. And they told the congregation to either give to the Lord or loan to the Lord. Then when I heard it, I was so troubled. How can we lend to God? I said, I was only an architect at the time. So every night I come home after work, I would study the two major portions of God's word on Tabernacle and Solomon's Temple. And both accounts, the Lord required His people to give willingly. How can we shame God and shame God's people by telling them to loan to God? It's an insult to Him. Everything belongs to God. How can we sell to God's people? You feel like it, you loan to God, but don't charge interest. It's even worse, isn't it? How can you loan to God and tell God, God, I don't charge you interest, you know? To me, it's terrible. It's unbecoming. So I was so troubled, I drafted a paper to read during the ACM when they were deciding to loan and to give. So I presented a paper, I said, we should only give, we cannot loan to God, it's wrong. And then they voted, I only got 8 votes, 300 over votes against me. So I learned a very important lesson. You just do what is right and trust the Lord to take care of the outcome. And so when the actual project was on, how can I say only give, right? And then now I loan, right? So I give almost everything, my savings. And then the Lord called me. I said, Lord, why don't you let me keep at least some savings before you call me? So when I went to full-time ministry, I really have nothing. Seriously. And then after the first year, I was supported by my previous church, $400 a month. Enough to pay for my fees, my school fees, and my room. Which after I got married during my second year in FEPC, Reverend told let me stay in one of the rooms, I pay $100 a month. But the challenge was, that church stopped me from serving because they became charismatic. And then God called me to go to Calvary Pandan, and the support at the time from Pandan was $200 a month. From $400, I got $200 a month. The school fees alone every semester was about $600. $200 a month. $100 went to pay for the room. So I only got every end of every semester, I pray very hard for the Lord to give me money because I don't even have money for my school fees. The $100, I got to take bus fare. I have to pay for books. So many other things. That every semester, when the new semester comes, I pray very hard for the Lord to give me money. I don't have the fees. Pandan only provided 200 and so preaching, preaching became very important. I still remember one evening when my wife asked me to buy dinner. I don't have money in my pocket. Then I finished preaching in one church, fellowship group. They gave me a love gift. I opened the envelope, $15. Just enough to buy dinner for myself and my wife. And I think one child. The Lord always provided. He provides. How? I just don't know. Now you ask me, how did I pay for my school fees? I don't know. Because sometimes when I want to go up and say to Mrs. Toh, the matron, I don't have money. Mrs. Toh will say, it's paid for. 
Who paid for it? I don't know. Somehow it's paid for. Where did it come from? I don't know. It's paid for. I didn't have the money. So how can I not, after I studied and the Lord provided for my studies, not to give my life and give as much as I can give strength and energy to serve the Lord? I have to. He gives so much. He provided so much. When I look back on my life, the struggle, the challenges, the Lord was always there. Prayed a lot, definitely. Prayed a lot. Trusting in the Lord to provide. And we in America, Pandang only supported us the barest minimum. Again, we used our savings. We bought a car that was 13 years old for 950 US dollars. Every night, the car did not break down. I thank God. So there's one time we finished our first masters. We drove from Indiana to Pennsylvania and 10 hour drive up mountains and we have to drag one U-Haul all our barang barang our bed and everything whatever we could carry we put inside our back the back of this U-Haul container by the time we touched down we spent one night in a motel and then by the time we arrived at the new place in Quaker Town in Pennsylvania the moment we parked the car I heard a loud clang got a boom the whole underneath of the car the whole exhaust pipe collapsed I thank God the moment we arrive, we have our older daughter, about two and a half years old, and then our second daughter, just a newborn. In the midst of winter, if the thing had broken down halfway, we are dead. Literally, we are dead. It's freezing cold. But the moment we arrive, the moment I switch off the engine, got a pang. The whole exhaust just collapsed right at the car park in the new apartment that we just arrived for our second masters to begin our study how not to be grateful and thankful to the Lord to see his provision his protection and his keeping so many many moments of our lives and so to serve him and to give the last breath and the last ounce of energy to serve him and to care for God's people is an honor and a privilege the least we can do after all that he has done for us and that is for all of us it's for every one of us. When you look back, can you not see the hand of God guiding you, helping you, protecting you, providing for you? And now that all He asks from us in return, I have saved you, I have redeemed you, I have helped you, I have done everything for you, I have reserved for you a place in heaven, and all I ask of you, the Lord says, is to be diligent, serve me faithfully. That's all. Is that too much for the Lord to ask? Let us pray. What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts, uh, what church dropouts say, why they stop attending church. Now, please remember 66% of, well, I take the American view, um, they are the most readily available results. They stop attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from